And our final 12th, finally, you know, tribe that we need to understand whose descendants are and where they are today is the tribe of Zebulun. Uh, it's, you know, all the information we have about Zebulun are very clear. There is no doubt about who Zebulun is, and Zebulun, brethren, is plainly the Netherlands. The Netherlands and Jacob prophesied in you know about about the uh, about Zebulun's descendants. You find the prophecies about Zebulun in Genesis chapter forty nine, verse thirteen, and he said, "Zebulun shall dwell at the heaven of the sea." Now this is interesting because the sea is here in plural in Hebrew, at the heaven of the seas, and he shall be for a heaven of ships. And his border shall be unto Sidon, speaking of the ancient Zebulun. Or you have you can have the other versions of, uh, of of this text translated from Hebrew. Zebulun shall settle the seashores. He will be a harbor for ships. This is Living Torah translation. And yet it says also in this prophecy, the Zebulun shall extend his legs to the fishery. All right, so he shall settle the seashores, he will be a harbor for ships, and he shall extend his legs to the fishery. Now, if you look at Joshua 19, verses 10 through 16, Zebulun's tribal allotment was between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee. So, therefore, no wonder that the seas is mentioned plural in Hebrew. If you also notice from Joshua 19 and then if you go to verse 24 to 31 you'll notice brethren that Zebulun's territory is separated from Sidon by the tribe of Asher and it is called Valley of Zebulun though it is Asher's territory because Asher failed to conquer this area but in later history Zebulun was able to conquer area of Canaanites since Asher didn't. An interesting confirmation of this prophecy is the valley paralleling this northern coast. Now, shipbuilding is another major industry in the Netherlands. The country is among the world's leading shipbuilders, with yards found mainly in Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Flushing. The Dutch merchant fleet ranks 16th in tonnage among the world's fleets. About half of Dutch shipping is involved with international freight and passenger operations. Small coasters, tankers and seagoing tugs also play an important role in the merchant fleet. Besides seagoing merchant vessels, thousands of small boats engage in inland commerce. In fact, brethren, the whole Netherlands is... Uh, uh, what's, what's the word, is, uh, is full of those small little canals, canals, you know, in between, they're like streets, basically, and they've got these boats, these small boats that engage in inland commerce. Now, the Netherlands has the densest network of waterways in the world. Again, such a small nation, but yet, you see, the densest network, that's obviously the connection of the descendants of Zebulun to the ships. You know, he shall be for a heaven, for a heaven of ships, and his border, you know, his borders shall be unto Sidon. A heaven for ships. What else about the Netherlands? Well, you mentioned, we mentioned also about the fish, that he will extend his legs to the fishery. You might know that the Dutch fishing industry has existed since ancient times. Today, the Dutch fishing fleet brings in all kinds of fish, cod, oysters, shrimp, eels, halibut, and most important, herring. Herring, brethren, is like a luxury thing that's uh, very common in the Netherlands, but not elsewhere in Europe. The Dutch rose to greatness as traders and seafarers. Their merchants and sea captains once made this small nation a leading world power. The country's location on the North Sea has made it a natural trade center. And you probably may know that the first ones, the first voyagers by the sea who discovered the different parts of the, of the unknown world at that time were actually the Dutch. In fact, brethren, even before the British, the great, the strongest maritime power in Europe and the world were the Dutchmen, was the Netherlands. 
Now Rotterdam, the famous Rotterdam is the largest port in Europe and it is one of the largest in the world. It's located on the new Maas River, which is part of the Rhine and Moose River system. It's the gate through which most of Western Europe's shipping, you know, all of much of the Western Europe shipping must pass through that gate. The Dutch economy is, of course, characterized by a large volume of trade, much greater than might be expected for so small a nation. Foreign trade is the mainstay of the Dutch economy. Since 1965, the port of Rotterdam has been the world's leading continent and is an important outlet for the industrial output of many miles, many miles or 39 kilometers of wharves, half of which are for sea-going vessels. Brethren, the gigantic Rotterdam Harbor stretches more than 17 miles or 27 kilometers. Now you see, do you see how is this all fulfillment uh, in these last days of the prophecy of Zebulun? Rotterdam port consists of the small north basin on the northern bank and three ports on the left bank. With the completion of Europort in 1975, Rotterdam became the greatest harbor in the world in terms of water surface and number of piers. Besides fishery and, you know, shipbuilding, you also have the machinery, electrical equipment and transport equipment industries in the Netherlands, but they specialize mainly, again, you know, in shipbuilding and repairing, concentrated in Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Dutch ports rank third in the world in cargo handled, with 70% of all goods transshipped, often after warehousing. This information you'll find in Encyclopedia Americana. Now, in First Chronicles chapter 12, we have interesting account of Zebulun, verse 33. First Chronicles 12, 33, it says of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank, they were not of double heart. And, you know, without any much elaboration, I need to tell you that the Netherlands were very much involved in resistance to the Catholic dominion over Europe. And the modern Dutch nation is not Catholic, by the way, which is quite interesting. Uh, and various parts of the true Church of God, true members of the Church of God, including Anabaptists, were also uh, present in the Dutch, in the Netherlands. Uh, also part of, you might remember what was their name, uh, they moved later to England, the uh, ah, the name now has escaped my memory, uh, Lollards, that's right, the Lollards. The Lollards were also originated first in the Netherlands, then later crossed the channel in search for freedom, and they... Uh, populated England. So the Netherlands, the Dutch history is very interesting about that. Also in Judges chapter 5 verse 18 you'll find the Zebulun jeopardized their lives unto the death, which is also quite interesting. Now Moses prophesied as he did about all tribes of Israel in Deuteronomy 33, he prophesied of the, uh, of the descendants of, of Zebulun in the last days, verses 18 and 19, Deuteronomy 33, 18, Rejoice Zebulun in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. Remember we read this when we were reading about, when we were talking about the tribe of Issachar. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck the abundance of the seas and treasures hidden in the sand. Now perhaps you would understand this better if you see some other translations. Zebulun rejoice in thy going out. It can be translated as Zebulun be glad in your ports. It's Fenton's translation. Or, Zebulun rejoice in your voyages abroad. Jerusalem, Bible translation. And, you know, they shall call the people of the mountains and they will suck the abundance of the seas and treasures hidden in the sand. Or, it can be living to us as they will be nourished by the bounty of the sea and by what is hidden in the secret treasures of the sands. Living Torah translation or Fenton's translation for they suck of the wide spreading seas. Mind you, in plural again. And also his mother, mother of Zebulun, Leah, Genesis 30, verse 20. She said, God has endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun, meaning dwelling. 
Now, if we use both, you know, using both Leah's and Moses' prophecies together, brethren, we can say that Zebulun will make himself a dwelling from the sea, just as Jacob prophesied. And yes, indeed, the Netherlands borders on the North Sea. The western part, where most of the people live, lies below sea level. If all the dikes and dams were opened at once, almost half of the country would be underwater. The Dutch have been reclaiming land from the water since the 10th century. Their western region was once a huge swamp, divided from the sea by a strip of sand dunes. The Dutch built dikes around swampy or flooded land, then pumped the water out. The pumping was done with windmills in the past, but today electric pumps are used, of course. And between the sandbar zone and the uplands of the east uh, is found the polder land, much of which is, was marsh and lagoon before it was drained. Its oil, partially peat and partially marine clay, very greatly, you know, very greatly in fertility. The clay soils are especially fertile and sandy soils occur both in the uplands and along the coastal belt, although low-grade peat soils are found in the east. You'll read this from Merit Students Encyclopedia, Volume 13. Now, they'll be sucking the riches of the seas, brother. The Netherlands obtained petroleum and natural gas from wells in the northeast and in the North Sea. Now, the salt reserves found mainly around Hengelo could supply the world with salt for more than 100 years. Dutch soil also yields fine quality clay for ceramics. And the people of the Netherlands have made a fine art of gardening. And they're also, as far as my cousin, one of my cousins reported to me, they have a very unique touch for the architecture. Uh, the way how they build houses and the way how they arrange them is very unique and very beautiful. They also sell cut flowers, they're well known in Europe for that, shrubs and bulbs to countries throughout the world, and even in this country as well, in which I'm right now. In the spring, fields of tulips, hyacinths, narcissus and other blooms cover large areas near Harlem and Alsmere, and the nurseries near Boxkop and other towns grow trees and bushes for gardeners in other countries where the sand dunes and uplands provide firm soil, apple, pear and plum orchards bloom. Now natural gas and oil are the chief natural resources of the Netherlands. They've got huge natural gas deposits that were discovered in the 1960s and 1970s and the Dutch reserves, brethren, are estimated to be the third largest in the world. So that's how they suck all the riches from the seas. Natural gas, besides being an important source of export income, of course, meets about half of the Netherlands' domestic, domestic energy needs. In the 1960s, oil was discovered at Schunebeck and in fields surrounding The Hague and Rotterdam. So you see, amazing how they have these riches from both the lands and also the riches from the sea. Now certainly these are what we have just read, these are the abundances of the seas. So uh, obviously we see how the prophecy is uh, basically being fulfilled in our day and age. You see in the 60s and 70s they discovered large deposits of gas, you know huge gas in the seas and in their own land and certainly so these are the abundance of the seas and treasure hidden in the sand because of this blessing dutch agriculture has one of the highest yields per acre in the world and also the netherlands ranks third in the world in the percent of total land under cultivation now regarding the fact that zebulon would be a dwelling we also know that the netherlands ranks behind only monaco and malta as the most densely populated country of Europe. For example, just to give you a comparison, in 1985, the population of the Netherlands was about 14.5 million, or 919 persons per square mile, or 355 per square kilometer. As of this year, which will be 2020, the population of the Netherlands stands at 17,134,872 people. So you see how even the number of their population has risen for 5 million in such a small country. Now Zebulun 
certainly does suck the abundance of the seas by constantly pumping out water so that land can be utilized. More than half the land in the Netherlands lies below sea level. Much of this land has been reclaimed from the seas. And another interesting and the last information about Holland. Holland, if we just uh, separate and deduce it, it can, also, it can also be equal to holy land. Well, brethren, this was the 12th tribe of Israel that we analyzed. Now we know who are the modern descendants of Zebulun. Therefore, with this, all this information, we might say that as a Philadelphia remnant, we now have a very clear in our minds what is the key of David. The key of David implies that those in the last days who are of Philadelphia remnant do know and do understand who are the modern descendants of Israel. What remains for us to do as a group of people, group of believers, is that we, brethren, continue the Ezekiel's commission, the Ezekiel's message. Ezekiel, I'll remind you, was not able to deliver his message to the ancient house of Israel, and therefore it is very clear that his warnings have remained for the modern times, for our times. And here we are, as we spread the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God, we have a special, and you know that I'm very keen about that special commission, we have a special commission to warn the modern house of Israel of its impending destruction because of its sins and we need to especially call the house of israel the modern house of israel to repentance yes we know that the modern house of israel being stiff-necked will not hear us we understand that nevertheless the commission remains to be fulfilled lest we will have the blood of the israelites on our own hands on our own head and hands we don't want that of course and we'll continue with now understanding this key of day we will continue to be reaching the israelitish nations as well as the whole world with the gospel message and will continue to hopefully witness to Israelitish nations about their need to repent and turn to their God, lest they be destroyed in the coming horrible great tribulation.